glass all waiting. Somebody said, I know that's right. I know that's right. I know that's right. I'm so glad about it that children on fans all waiting. It might knock on my door. But it didn't come into my living room because trouble don't last all way. Amen. So we thank God for the privilege of being in the house. We thank God for the privilege of coming before him in his word. And we just want God to open our minds and our hearts and our understanding so that we can actually hear the word of the Lord our God. But I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Genesis, the third chapter. I just sense in my spirit that perhaps you should not have too much difficulty finding our text for this morning, this afternoon. Genesis, the third chapter, but if you do find yourself having some difficulty, amen, the altar belongs to you, amen. Genesis, the third chapter, we're going to begin reading in verse 14, concluding after verse 15. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. For a little while, I want us to explore the subject from disappointment to provision. From disappointment to provision. I ask that you stay with me and I believe you'll see how this thing will unfold in just a little while. From disappointment to provision. Let us pray together. Father, here we are once again, standing, O oh God, in your presence, approaching you through your holy and divine word. Father, we are hungry, we are thirsty, we are looking, Father, to be fed from you. And we just pray, Father, even now, in the name of Jesus Christ, that you'll open up our eyes and open up our ears, open up our spirits, Father, and just open up our understanding. And we just pray, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, that you, Lord God, would just do a great work, oh, Father God, in this place. And Father, we pray that you would have your way that you administer, Father, to your people, and that you lift them, O oh God, from where they are to where they need to be, even as we consider from disappointment to provision. Father, anoint me even now, fresh and anew by your Spirit, to bring forth this, your word, and I'll give you glory, and I'll give you honor, and I shall give you praise. In the blessed name of Jesus Christ, we pray with thanksgiving. Let God's precious people say, Amen. Can we get somebody on the door, please? From disappointment to provision. When we speak of God, I know that we speak of God in high and lofty terms. And it should be this way. Anytime we're thinking of God or speaking of God, how else can we speak of God except to use high and and a lofty terms. What do you say when you speak of God? We begin to think perhaps that God is omniscient. God knows all things. There's nothing that escapes the knowledge of God. All knowledge that exists is within the realm of God's knowing. Because God is omniscient and we describe God in that way and we speak of God in that way. We speak of God in high and lofty terms. But we also say that God is omnipresent. We understand the idea that there's no place that we can go. There's no place we can run to. There's no place that we can hide where we can't find God and God can't find us. And this speaks of a, a high and lofty God. Anytime we can say that God is omnipresent, that God is everywhere at the same time, there's no place we can run to escape from our God. God is omniscient. God is omnipresent. God is also omnipotent. God has all power in his hand. You would never encounter a situation in your life where God does not have the power to bring you out. Amen. Think about your difficulties. Think about your crises. 
There's nothing that you will ever face in this life where God will say to you, I am short of power or lacking in power, but God has the power to bring you out of your situation and your circumstance. You might be weak within your own soul, in your own mind, in your own spirit, but God has the power to bring you out. So we speak of God as being omnipotent and we speak of God using high and lofty terms because that's how we speak of God. We also speak of God as being sovereign. We must ask permission to do things. But God is sovereign. God does not have to check with anybody. He does not need the approval of a board. He does not need a majority decision. When God chooses to act, and to, when God chooses to do some things because he's sovereign, no one can stop the hand of God. But we also speak of God as El Shaddai. El Shaddai, he's the all-sufficient one. He's the God who is more than enough. And we speak of God in high and lofty terms because God is a high God. He is a lofty God. He's a great, big, wonderful God. And we must speak of God using high and lofty terms. There can be no question about it. God is deity. God is divine. Yeah. Yet we appreciate that God will condescend to our level. He is high, he is lifted up. We speak of God in the high and long the terms, and so we must do that. But God condescends to our level. God comes down to where we are, and he allows us to understand him. He allows us to have a relationship with him. He allows us to be in fellowship with him. God says, I'm not going to keep it up here. I'm going to take it to the bottom level, to the bottom drawer, because I don't want you to get all that I am and all that I have in store for you. So, so God kind of sends to our level and God allows us to connect with him as the Bible speaks of God in human terms that we can relate to. I want to give you just two examples to show you that we can relate to God because we have some emotions just as God has emotions and we can understand certain things happening in our lives. In Genesis the sixth chapter, we find that God had a problem with his creation. And the word of God says in Genesis 6, 6, the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. Have you ever faced a situation and said you regretted taking this action or that action and, and your heart then was deeply troubled because you, you said, well, I made this decision. I made this choice and I, I should have made this. I, I regret that I did that. Well, the word says God regretted that he had made human beings on the earth. Why? Because the, the earth was filled with wickedness and sin and disobedience. So God regretted that he had made human beings on the earth. And his heart was deeply troubled. We can relate to that. God is who he is, but we can understand something about our hearts being deeply troubled. We can understand something about regretting those things that we have done. But we also find in Exodus 4.14, you might not be able to relate to this, so I'm going to ask that you just use your imagination. But we find a situation where we have a reluctant missionary who was just hesitant about going on the mission field as God was calling his name from the burning bush that we find in Exodus 3. You don't know anything about God trying to call you to a task and you being hesitant or resistant or reluctant. You don't know anything about that, so just use your imagination. But Moses, we find, he was offering God every excuse in the book. Moses wrote some excuses to add to the book to try to tell God why like he was not the one to do what God was telling him to do. Let me pause right here and put a pen in it. What is God telling you to do? Whereby you're offering all these excuses and all this rationale and all this logic as to why you can't do what God is calling your name for. I just want to at least let you know what happened in the text. In Exodus 4.14, the word says, KJB says, God was wroth. Modern translation lets us know that God was very angry with a reluctant Moses. So can we relate to the, the emotion of being angry? So though God is high and lifted up, God allows us to understand him because the Bible speaks of God in terms that we can relate to. Regretting an action, having a heart that is deeply troubled or being very angry because of someone's resistance. So we understand then that we can relate to God and we can connect with God. Now the Greek philosophy of impassibility asserts that God 
He had not feel and experience. He cannot feel or experience emotions. So what the reality is, God can feel emotions. Now, the Greek philosophers would say that God is impassable. That nothing that happens can touch God in such a way as to move him in his emotions or in his feeling. That's what the Greek philosophy of impassibility say, that God does not experience feelings or emotions. Notice I said the Greek philosophy of impassibility. The Greek philosophy of impassibility asserts that God cannot feel or experience emotion. But, but I'm not standing upon the Greek philosophy. I'm standing on the word of God. And according to the word of God, God can in fact experience feelings and emotions. We've already seen that God regretted his actions and created humankind. We understand that God's heart was deeply troubled. We recognize that God was very angry with a reluctant motive. So God can in fact be touched by emotion and feelings. I'm going somewhere, trust me, I'm going somewhere. Now the Bible paints a different picture. God can feel and he can experience emotions. Therefore, we can conclude then that as we see God in chapter 3 of Genesis, God was disappointed. We, we know that he can feel emotions and he, he can feel things. We feel things. God feels things. God, as we find him in the third chapter of Genesis, was disappointed. Now, why was God disappointed? Take a look at the creation account. The word says that God created and it was good. And then the second thing, God created and it was good. And God kept creating and came to the sixth day. He fashioned dust on the ground and breathed into man's nostril that man became a living soul. Man was made, humankind was made in the very image of God. We bear the divine imprint of God. God identifies with us. And when God created humankind, which is the zenith or the apex of his creation, we recognize that God said, and it is very good. God was able to look at his hand and work and say, I've done a great job. I've made humankind in my very own image. But then we find, of course, that God placed Adam and Eve in a good place. Now, if you live here, I'm sorry, but God did not place Adam and Eve in the ghetto. He didn't place them in the projects, but he, he made them in their own image and then placed them in the Garden of Eden. We're talking about an idyllic place. We're talking about a place of provision. We're talking about a plush place. God placed the man and the woman in the garden of Eden. So God was doing everything he needed to do. He, he made them in his own image. He, they bore God's divine imprint. He put them in a good place, provided for them. So surely there's, there's nothing else that they need. God provided everything that was needed for Adam and Eve. God had them in a good place. We can say it this way. They had the hookup. And a man was being, hook me up, brother. Hook me up, sister. We all always want a hookup. But Adam and Eve had the hookup. Made in the very image of God and living in the garden of Eden, a plush place that God provided. Yeah. They were hooked up yeah. from the floor. But then they disregarded the commandment of God. They, they were in a good place, made in the image of God, living in the Garden of Eden, but then they disregarded the commandment of God. And when they disregarded the commandment of God, now we have the issue of original yeah. sin. Yeah. Now we have the issue of sin coming in, which causes death. Now we have the issue of sin coming in and causing estrangement between God and his creation. Now we have a whole lot of problems. And when I was a young, budding theologian, in my teenage years, I had a problem with Adam. And basically my problem went a little something like this. You mean to tell me I'm going to hell because Adam sinned? Something don't seem right. You mean to tell me because he sinned, now I'm going to hell? You mean to tell me I'm going to bust hell right over because Adam sinned? That don't even seem right. I, I, I'm not too happy about Adam because Adam had to mess up. Adam had the hookup, yet he messed up. God gave him everything he needed. He still disobeyed God. So now I have a problem. I blame Adam for original sin and for our estrangement from God. I was upset with Adam. How dare he miss the mark and mess things up? 
But then I begin to get a little older and a little wiser. And I realize that it is very easy for us to point the finger at others without ever acknowledging our own culpability, without ever acknowledging our own wrong in a situation. I, I was pointing at Adam, but my mama told me, boy, when you point at somebody, remember you have three fingers pointed back at yourself. Mama was a theologian, you didn't know that. But I was upset with Adam for more than a little while because I felt that Adam messed things up between me and God. But then I concluded, we know how to mess things up on our own. Can I get four witnesses? We, we know how to mess some stuff up on our own. We can have stuff hooked up. Stuff can be blushed, God can be walking with us, God can be talking with us, God can be leading us, God can be empowering us, yet we just have a reason to want to step outside of all that goodness of God and we mess up on our own. But we don't like to say we messed up on our own. We want to explain it that if that person had not done that or done this, then perhaps I wouldn't have messed up because normally I'm an upstanding Christian, you know. I don't cuss that much. I don't steal that much. I don't lie that much. But what happened was when he or she, we, we don't like to take responsibility. But the reality is we know how to mess some stuff up on our own to where it's even perplexing to us where we can't even imagine why in the world did I take this course of action when everything was in place? I had a good job, had a good woman, had money to be. Why in the world did I make this decision? I don't understand how I can mess this up like I messed it up. Now, I'm going to pause because somebody need to catch up to that word. I know somebody need to catch up to it. Somebody need to catch up to it and say, yeah, that's me, that's me, that's me. That's me. I somehow know how to mess some stuff up when the sun is shining. I want to go ahead and cover the sun if I can because I don't want the sun to shine too much with it. I want to find a way to mess some stuff up. And it's almost like it's intentional. Stuff gets so bad. Like, how in the world? You need some help to mess that stuff up like that. You need some help. Who helped you? Who helped you? Surely you have some help. You, you, can, you can't ever get yourself in that situation by yourself. You need some help. You need a team, a crew, a troop. You need something to help you. But we have the ability to mess things up on our own. I was speaking to a young lady recently, and she lamented to me that she said, you know what, things are going very well. No concerns, no issue. We the Lord, we tight. But then I just messed it up. And the person lamented, I always seem to mess things up when things are going well. Now notice the disappointment in that statement. But can you imagine how God is disappointed as well? Where God is setting things up, where God is laying things out for you, when God is providing, where God is speaking by spirit, where God is opening doors, where God is shining light on the path that you need to walk on. God is doing all these things and somehow we still find a way to mess up. We thank God for how he blesses, but then we somehow begin to drift away from the very blessings of God. And we wonder how in the world did I drift out here? How did I get out here when God had everything I needed? God set the table and I wanted to go to another table for some reason. God prepared this house, but I wanted to go to another house. God prepared this job, but I needed to go to another job. We have a proclivity uh, to mess some stuff up. And it disappoints us because we ask ourselves the question, how in the world did I mess this up? So we disappoint ourselves. But God is disappointed as well. You see, Adam and Eve in the text, they had it made. Yet they blew it. See, it is easy for us to say, Adam and Eve messed up. We messed up. We missed the mark. God allows us to be in a blessed place. But somehow or another, we, we find ways to mess up what God is on. Does anybody hear me this morning? We, we find a way to mess some stuff up. And I'm not trying to browbeat you, but I'm going somewhere with this. Trust me when I tell you, I am going somewhere. See, Adam and Eve had it made, yet they blew it. They blew it. But this is where it's interesting to me. I want you to take note that in Genesis, the third chapter, we find, in my estimation, the first human drama 
in the Bible. The first human drama in the Bible, at least from my perspective. But it is not a stretch to say that we have before us a courtroom scene. Look at some of your study Bibles. You may find the word diverted over the passage that you're looking at because it speaks of God's judgment. It speaks of God's verdict. So we have, in a sense, a courtroom scene. But I want you to take note that in a court of law, the judge and the attorneys normally are mindful of setting a precedent. In other words, they have to be very careful what they do in a given case because other lawyers will come behind them and say, I want to cite this particular case law because this was already decided in the courts and the courts decided this way. So now I need you to do things this way because it's already been done before because the precedent had been set. So, so the judge has to be careful, the attorneys have to be careful not to set the wrong precedent because a precedent sets the tone but what is the follow in the future? Please stay with me now. The president sets the tone for what's going to happen in the future. So it's important to ask this question, what is God's disposition towards us when we totally blow it, miss the mark, and disappoint him? We find this first case of human trauma, and God has to deal with the people. See, what God is about to do next is to establish a precedent which will say, this is how I choose by an act of my will to deal with you all in the future. He, he said the president. So we need to pay close attention to find out how did God respond to the failure of humankind? Because certainly what we see here is a setting of a precedent. So one, we know the heart of God for today, for the present. But we also know the heart of God for the future. We know how God is inclined to deal with us. So we need to find out, what did God do? Because we are going to disappoint God at times. And we need to have some sense of what is God's response when we disappoint Him. Some of you, I believe, are sitting there right now under the heavy weight of the burden of disappointing God. Say, how will I ever come back from disappointing God? I said so much. I talked so much about what I'm going to do when I do this. I'm going to people disciplined in this way, I'm going to be generous in that way, I'm going to be sacrificial in this way, and the whole lot of talk's been going on, but then you realize that I've disappointed myself and God. I told God I'd be available for ministry, but then you ran in the opposite direction like Jonah. So now there's disappointment that you have to contend with, and you're asking, can God ever allow me back into his presence? God spoke to me, some might say, a few years ago, and I still have not done what God said do. So now I'm disappointed and I believe that I am disappointing God. So we need to find out how did God respond to the fear of humankind that we find in our text. Because again, how he handled it is a setting forth of a precedent. First of all, God dealt with Satan, which represented the serpent. See now, the serpent had a part to play in the fall of humankind. So God had to deal with the serpent and he had to curse the serpent. But let's make sure we understand that though Satan had a pivotal part, a key role, we cannot embrace the words of the false prophet Flint Wilson. You can't claim that the devil made me do it. You, you, you can't claim that. He, he, he was a false prophet when he said that, that the devil made me do it. Now the devil can suggest some stuff. But, but the devil did not make you do it. We understand that, that the enemy is a tempter, he's the devil, he played a key role in it, but he did not make anybody do anything. But he played a part, he played a role. So God had to deal with the enemy. God had to deal with Satan himself. Now we need to understand that Satan's work in the garden was a deceptive work and it wrecked havoc as it relates to relationship and fellowship between God and his creation. The devil came in and changed some stuff between God and the people of God, between Adam and Eve. So Satan came in to cause some trouble. So God had to curse the serpent and then announce that one was coming to undo the work of the enemy. We are in Advent season as we're looking for the coming of Christ. We're remembering the coming of Christ. So even in this particular passage in Genesis 3.15, we find the first verse in the Bible that speaks of the coming Messiah who would come and undo the work of the enemy. So God had to deal with Satan. God had to curse Satan. God had to let him know that he was going to eat 
dust. And, and, and some of us look at the text and say, well, I wonder this, did a serpent walk up on all them two feet because the word says he's going to be crawling on his belly. I don't believe that's the case. The issue is, as you look at other scripture, the issue is eating the dust, which is a symbol and an indication of utter defeat and degradation. So though the enemy was victorious in that particular skirmish, he was about to lose the war because now God was going to cause him to eat dust all the days of his life. So God had to deal with the enemy and God will deal with the enemy in your life as well. Wow. Hallelujah. God will do some stuff. God will handle the enemy that's causing, that's wrecking havoc in your life. Now we need to understand, again, in Genesis 3.15 is the first verse that proclaimed the gospel. It's the first verse that spoke of Christ who was to come. But we need to ask ourselves the question, how does God deal with the disappointment that we cause him sometimes? Now let me see if I got some great folk in here. I want to see a show of hands of anyone in here who has caused God disappointment in the past. So then we need to know how does God deal with us when we disappoint him? Because sometimes the disappointment that we feel is so heavy and so vexing to our souls, we think we need to run from God and hide from God. But we need to find out what is God saying? How does God deal with us when we disappoint Him? Well, we understand that God responds with grace Hallelujah. and mercy Hallelujah. and provision yeah. for the sin that estranged us from Him. I'm grateful for that. If I disappoint God, and I do disappoint God, God extends grace and mercy, and he provides a way to be reconnected to him. So we need to understand, how does God deal with us when we're facing our disappointment, when we disappoint God, when we don't find ourselves doing the thing that we need to do? Now, the text deals with the enmity, enmity between the snake and the woman. And the seed of the snake and the seed of the woman, that's surface level stuff. We know when we see a snake, we run and we don't like snakes. That's surface level stuff. But there's a bigger, broader point that the author is reaching for here. It's a bigger, broader battle that is embedded in the text. But I feel strange. I feel strange using the word battle. Because when I think about battle, it does not seem to be an accurate representation of what was going to really happen. Because I don't want to call it a battle. Because when you look at Jesus going against the devil, anybody else, it's not necessarily a battle. It's a right out. It's a route. It's a runaway. It's a beat down. It's a beat up. But it's not necessarily a battle. But I couldn't think of any other word that, that would fit here. To, so I, I'll say it, call it a battle that's embedded in this particular text. We, we find God saying that, that Satan's heel, or Satan rather, would bruise the heel of the one who's to come. Now, you know how that is. You, you try to do some stuff and you, you momentarily or temporarily hinder. It's just a bruising of the heel. We find the enemy trying to bruise the heel of our Savior when Jesus was actually tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. He was fasting. He was tempted by the enemy. So we find then that the enemy was trying to bruise the heel of the Savior, trying to come against the Savior to keep him from doing what God had called him or ordained him to do. Sometimes the enemy tries to bruise our heel because God has spoken in our ear. God has spoken in our spirit. We've heard the clarion call of God, but the enemy comes to try to tell you, you have not been called to do this. You have not been anointed to do this. You don't have the river thought to get it done, but God has said, I've called you, I've equipped you, I've anointed you. And then the enemy comes to try to bruise our heel to keep us from walking in all the things that God has ordained for our lives. The enemy comes to bruise the heel. And he comes faithfully to bruise the heel. He comes to try to stop the Savior for getting all the glory from your life as you're connected to him. He's just trying to bruise the heel. But we also found that the enemy tried to bruise the heel of Christ when he was working through the religious leaders to oppose Jesus and his ministry. If you ought to find some support anywhere, you ought to find it in the church amongst the religious leaders. But the enemy was trying to use religious leaders. He was trying to bruise the heel of the Savior. But we also find from the word of God that, that the enemy entered Judas and he betrayed Jesus. 
You see, Satan was trying to get at Jesus' yeah. heel. He was trying to bruise his heel. Then we find that, that Jesus was brought up on trumped up charges. He, he was brought before the courts. He was scourged. And then he was placed on the cross. And then he was trying to bruise his heel. So the enemy thought he had him when he placed him on the cross. The enemy was patting himself on the back and said, I'm a mighty fine work. I bruised him. But what he does not realize is that while Jesus was on the cross, we were on his mind. Oh, yes, we were. And the Lord was working things out for us. The enemy tried to bruise the heel of the Savior, and that's all it was, a bruise, because then Christ came and crushed the head of the enemy. See, Jesus went to the cross, but he went to the cross bearing our sins in his body. So I love that reality that Jesus bore our sins in his body, took our sins to the cross. He shed his precious blood. The enemy touched his heel. And Jesus said, you touch my heel, now I'm going to crush your head. I'm going to take you totally out. I'm going to give you into a two-piece. The light's going to go out. Because I am the Savior, so we recognize the great work of Christ. Crushing the head of the enemy. Now, I, I love this picture because think about this. Christ was on the cross. Christ had been convicted, placed on the cross. Christ was bleeding. Christ appeared to be defeated. That was the original Roman dope there. So you, you think you got me here. I'm, I'm just buying my time. Go ahead, do what you're going to do. Buy the work, do what you're going to do. But I'm coming back at the appropriate time. So, so we thank God that even when it looks like you're bleeding, you may be bleeding. Your head may be hanging down. There might not be strength in your body. It seems like you have been defeated. That's the time where God's going to come and turn that situation around us for you. Because the enemy comes to try to touch the heel of the same thing. He comes to crush the enemy's head. Even in your life, you will crush the enemy's head in your life. He's trying to rob you. Lord and God has poured into you. So Jesus appeared to have lost the battle. But Jesus was chilling. Because he died. But he was biding his time. First day, just chilling. Second day, just chilling. Third day, and now rise again. That can't keep me in the ground. So the enemy thought that he had won a victory, but Christ won the victory. And God spoke of the reality before it ever happened. So how does God deal with us and our disappointments? God says, I am disappointed. I'll give you everything that you need. I'll give you the Holy Spirit. I'll give you the word. I'll give you the leader. I'll set the situation up. I made provision. You still blew it. Yes, I am disappointed. Yet, I'm going to also give you some provision. I, see, God knows how to move his disappointment from him. See, God does not get wrapped up in the disappointment, but God knows how to jettison his disappointment. Say, sure, I'm disappointed. You should have known better. You should have done better. Yet, I'm going to provide a way for you to be brought back to me. How does God deal with us in our disappointment? When we disappoint God, does God kick us to the curb? The word says that God immediately begins speaking of the Savior who would come to save the day. And that's a beautiful word. See, when you find yourself in a situation, you find that you have disappointed God, when you find yourself carrying that weight and that burden, you need to remind yourself, Jesus is coming. Because the text tells us, we find trouble in the text, we find the crisis in the text, but the word says, Jesus is coming. So when you have blown it, and you think there's no way back, say, Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming. And see, the thing is, you might have to wait a little while, but guess what? Jesus is coming. Jesus was prophesied centuries before he ever came forth. But the word says in Galatians, in the fullness of time. In other words, right when God needs to bring Jesus on the scene, to deal with some stuff in your life, that's when Jesus is coming on the scene. In the fullness of time. But we can we give glory and honor to God because we know that even though we disappoint him, God is saying, I have provision. And I, I was sitting there, Jesus. Now, Jesus already came. 
But even today, we can just, we can thank God for the reality that when I find myself in a place where I've disappointed God because I've heard him, but I've questioned him. Where God said, act and I would refuse that. Not out of shit disobedience, but I was just scared. Sometimes folk get scared. But they were disappointed with ourselves. I, I should have moved. I should have acted. God spoke to me and I heard him, but I did not move. And when we find that we have disappointed God, cheer up, my brother. Cheer up, my sister. Because the text tells us that even when God is disappointed, he knows how to move from disappointment to provision. God knows how to say, I'm going to move this far from it. I'm not going to hold this. I'm not going to nurse this. I'm going to disperse this. Why? Because I'm going to move from disappointment to provision. I am going to make a way for you to come back. I am going to make a way for you to get it right. I am going to make a way for you to walk with me on the days of your life. So I don't care what you've done to disappoint God. It ain't over. It ain't over. It ain't over until God says it's over. And God does not know how to pronounce it is over. God does not know how to articulate it is over. God says, stand in there I see my salvation. Yeah. What have you done to disappoint God? I'm not trying to bring that up to condemn. I'm trying to bring up to let you know that God knows how to move from disappointment to provision. God provides grace. God provides mercy. God provides healing. God provides restoration. restoration. Why? He knows how to move from disappointment to provision. And if you have disappointed God, I don't care what it is, there's provision for you. God does not bring it back up in your face like we do sometimes. But God moves from disappointment to provision. So beloved, rest in God. For God set the precedent in Genesis 3.15 Saying, this is how I choose to act in the future. That when my children disappoint me, I'm already inclined to move from disappointment to provision, providing grace and mercy and a way back. God has made a way back for you. And he has moved from disappointment to provision. As you rest on your feet.